Okay. So we look at our brain here and we begin to think, okay, what does it look like when a person's processing information? And you know, my favorite one is you know, the middle school kid and he's sitting there in his history class and taking Texas history for the third time or the fourth time. So he's supposed to stay interested in that. But anyway, he's sitting in class and first the front of his head has to decide, you know what, I really do want a good grade or I really do want to learn some more about Texas history. And so he has to decide to be engaged. It's more of a frontal decision making kind of thing. But then he has to focus his attention. So I'm going to focus my attention on the teacher and when she walks back and forth in front of the class, I'll watch her back, walk back and forth. And I'm not going to be looking at this cute girl over here next to me who I really want to be looking at. I'm going to be focusing my attention up here. And then once it's in, once I got my attention there, the information's coming in. It comes in through my eyes. I watch what she's writing on the board. It comes in through my ears. I hear what she's saying. Um, if I was doing a science experiment, it'd be coming in through my fingers because I'm doing that. Um, if she's uh, you know, raising questions, then people, I might even say an answer that would be part of, uh, of the thing. So it's coming in in these different kinds of ways. If we just pick vision, Brain's a silly thing. It comes in through your eyes up here, and it goes to your vision system in the back of your brain. Um, the, there are a bunch of dots, a bunch of neurons in the back of your brain that match the back of your eye, you know, you know uh, point for point. But then there's another layer in there that matches points, and they turn them into lines. And lines get turned into letters. And letters get shipped up here in the, in the shape of words. And words up here get started to get connected to meaning. And then the vision of the word and the sound of the word get in integrated. And so it's come back here, and now it's up here, and now it's going to go to output. And output could be I'm writing down my notes with what I've heard. It comes out my fingers, comes out my mouth. My teacher asks me a question. I tell, so, tell her about it. It comes out my eyes when I roll my eyes because this is as boring as it can possibly be. And so there are all different kinds of ways that information gets in and then it gets back out. Now, depending on the kiddo, Different parts of that brain can be working well and different parts can be working poorly. And if we think about our kids, we can see what are the strengths we want to use in our therapy interventions. You know, where are their, do their things, strengths lie? Um, one of my favorite examples that totally drives teachers crazy is the kiddo who draws and he draws the whole time and they say, you got to take notes, you got to take notes. And he says, oh, but I can't take notes. All right. But then sometimes he writes, and he writes beautifully. It takes him a long time, but he writes beautifully. And the teachers see he's just a lazy bum. Well, so I go in, and I do my testing, and his handwriting kind of stuff is all down in the you know, 70s and 80s in terms of his scores. But his visual spatial drawing stuff is all up in the 110s and 120s. This guy can write, I can draw, which is all over here. But when he needs to use this part to put what means something down here, and especially to do it fast, it's not happening. Right? In fact, if you tell him to write, and he tries to write, he won't hear anything the teacher says. Because he has to be so busy focusing on his fingertips that he can't make any sense of what the teacher's saying because he split his attention and now he can't focus anymore. Okay. So it's just that, that again, I, what I do is I, I'm not explaining the whole brain to you, but I'm giving you an example of you've got a breakdown somewhere. How does that breakdown affect how this person is going to process and what can be done for them? I was telling Dr. Gentry, you know, that, you know, when I work with a kid who has the, you know, the 80 verbal IQ and the 120 or 130 uh, nonverbal IQ, I'm a verbal kind of guy. And I'm just going, what is that kid's life like? How, what does he actually understand? If I say, well, if I say it, he may not even understand it. Does he have a vision of people get angry and there's an image of anger in his head? And I, I'm not sure what he gets. But when I'm doing my therapy, I, if I'm trying to talk about the future, then I, he can't figure out his credits and he never gets involved in his credits. So we cut up a bunch of pieces of paper and it's all the credits he could earn and we have a line across the floor that goes out to, you know, into the hall and then we have to figure out if you don't get this credit, what's going to happen to our line? All right, so I'm trying to shift to can I reach that right side of his brain, the nonverbal part that's, that's trying to integrate. So it guides me in those kinds of, of ways. So one thing I did was try to develop an example that might carry us through the different things that I'll be talking to you about today. So we've got this kiddo. The kiddo, let's say Sammy, he's in elementary school and the teacher says he has problems. 
Well, one of the nice things about schools, I'm being a little smart aleck here, is I never have to worry about diagnosis because the teachers will always tell me. <laughs> He's got attention deficit. Well, I'm not supposed to say that, but you know, and so, but you come in, this kid's not paying attention. You know, she's trying to talk to the class, and he's, you know, looking around, and he's talking to other people, and, and he's not following instructions, and he's overactive, uh, and he gets angry and oppositional if she tries to tell him something, and it's like, well, you can see why she's thinking he might have attention problems. Um, but, you know, he, he, if she asks him a question, he does, can't do the answer, and so, but he goes out on the playground when he's doing what he wants to do, well, he's great, and he's even nice to the teachers, and he's nice to his friends, and he lines up when he's supposed to. All right, so what's up with this kiddo? So there'd be a couple possibilities. One is he might be attention deficit disorder, and then he can't, the, you know, this attention system in his brain is not, you know, giving him enough uh, focus so he can use the rest of his brain to figure out what's going on in this class. And then he's lost, and he's confused, and so he's distracted, and he does other things. But on the other hand, his attention system might be running fine, but it might be that in his brain, he can't put words together. And this teacher's yap, yap, yapping along, and he doesn't know what she's talking about. Well, if, if I were sitting in a lecture and they were giving the lecture in Russian, how long would it take me to look attention deficit? Um, again, my wife is wonderful. She would say I look attention deficit during the English language lectures. But, you know, but in Russian, clearly, I'm going to be attention deficit in about two minutes. Okay, because I'm going to start messing with my you know, cell phone, or I'm going to be writing something, or drawing something, or doing something, because I'm clueless. And if he has verbal processing problems, that's what it's like for him, sitting in there. <coughs> um, so, so he could be attention deficit. It, could be, it may be that he doesn't like people telling him what to do. So now he has to sit there in this class, and his teacher won't let him do stuff. But he's an angry kid, and he's tired of being told what to do. And so he's going to give her a hard time, and he's not going to pay attention because that's what she wants him to do. So there are all these different possibilities that would be operating in different parts of the brain and reflect different things in him. And so if we can think about those. And, and one of the things is I can take my you know, that I take a neuropsychological approach to doing my school evaluations, so I'm looking at all the pieces and how they work. But if I take my big picture and look at how does his attention look, how do, does he get information in different ways, how does he deal with words, does he do that very well, how does he deal with, you know, visual spatial things, is he a good puzzle kid, does he like that? How does he do with output? Can he talk to me about it, but he can't write it? If I think about just the behavior of my kid, okay, that I'm working with, I can start to get a neuropsychological picture of, how this, of what this kid's strengths and weaknesses are. And, and, and so having that image of the big picture, you know, can guide me in thinking of that. So we've got the big picture. I've got these four highlighted, and that's, this is mainly the input process output um, you know, set of, uh, of blocks. And so you, you've got to pay attention. It comes in through the different sensory systems. In the different uh, sensory areas, there's integration, and then the integration pulls together the different sensory areas. And then the, the, there is motor behavior. There's a motor response that comes out. And so we get, use the, the, um, the big picture to guide us in that kind of way. But everything has these pieces, and we've got, we left this stuff down here, and we're gonna address those individually, but there is, an, you know, in, instead of saying input, process, output, we can also say top, middle, bottom. All right, and so top, middle, bottom would be, you know, toward the top of the brain or the front of the brain. We have decision making, higher order thinking. I decide that I wanna get better, so I'm gonna work on my skills to get better and that kind of thing. Uh, and so we have the top of the brain, and, and so, you know, of course we would love for that to be in charge all the time. Um, but what you know, Derry, Berry, and Tucker in 1992 did this really, I thought it was a really awesome article that just described the influences going up and down, up and down the brain. And so, you know, your influences can start from the bottom. Each of us has a different level of arousal we maintain. Some people are really slow and easy and low key. Other people are keyed up and ready all the time. Um, arousal can happen, you know, arousal problems can happen. Kids who suffer early child abuse don't learn, and, or childhood neglect, don't learn to modulate their own emotions. 
not in a, I get angry all the time, but in a, I get worked up and I can't settle myself down. Okay, and so, I, they, so, so that happens down here. Emotions are more in the mid part of the brain, and so if there's depression and sadness, or if there's bipolar disorder, or things like that, then those are contributing to the processing. And then up at the front, there's the decision. I'm gonna stop this, I'm gonna think about it, I'm gonna be in charge. Um, but the deal is, everything influences everything. I can use that, let's stop and think, I'm gonna do my cognitive behavioral interventions, so with those, I'm starting here at the top, and we're gonna manage those feelings down at the bottom. Um, on the other hand, if I'm in a certain mood, all right, or if I'm in a fearful situation or something like that, as the information is coming in, even before I know what's coming in, my emotions and my mood change what my perceptions are. And so I will perceive it differently because I'm in a different mood state. Um, so it's a case of everything influences, influences going up, influences going down. And so we want to be paying attention to that. And uh, you know, I talked for a minute about you know, kids who have arousal problems. And how did, you know, when you think of how does all this stuff interact, this, this mom, there was a, a mom, she was actually an adoptive mom. She adopted this kiddo when he was about one and a half. Okay, the child protective, you know, people found this kid strapped in his car seat, covered in flies and feces, you know, that was the first year of this kid's life, okay? That means this kid didn't have anybody helping him manage, you know, soothing himself or learning how to modulate himself or anything, and he was still having trouble with that. He ended up with a mom who was pretty rigid and she's gonna do it this way. And so she was bringing structure into this kid's life. But the, the point of what she did that one day, she was saying, you know, he's getting better and better. He's getting so he can do his academic work better and calm himself down and stay focused. But you can tell when he's getting too worked up because he starts flipping his letters again, okay? And so he had come up cognitively through the process of learning to keep his letters in order and learning to do his reading and spelling. And so he was getting along moderately well. And that's sort of this, you know, cognitive integration going up here. But when his arousal got too much, the cognitive stuff falls apart. It's just one example of how do these things interact and, and how does it help uh, to try to pay attention to these as we go along. The, the, to me, the, the one clue that I, that I try to use when I'm trying to decide is it like a bipolar thing or is it an arousal kind of thing um, is does it happen sort of all the time or does it only happen sort of with negative emotion kind of stuff? Okay, so my bipolar kid goes through the roof when he's exploding and getting angry. They just can't handle that kind of stuff. Somewhere in, in my talk, I ended up talking about this kid who flips his letters when he gets too worked up. Guess what? He does not get to go on field trips. Why didn't he get to go on field trips? Because the day before, we're going on a field trip, we're going on a field trip, and we start to get worked up. And guess what? The day of the field trip, there's no way. He is running down the halls, up and down the halls, and so, sorry kid, you are not going on this field trip. It's so sad, but his, his arousal in general, it's not that he got angry that day, he's just too worked up. So that's, you know, again, what's the level we're working at? This is my complex model here, but when I start to see that discrimination between the emotion, is this a negative bipolar emotional explosion, manic and agitated and that kind of thing, or it's situational, but when he gets happy, he gets happy, and when he gets sad, he can't control that either. When he gets angry, he can't control it. It's more of a, an arousal or a global kind of thing. So it's, it's, it's the, the simple way I try to make that discrimination. So we've been talking about input, process, output, the pieces and steps that, that contribute to what's happening. And so now we're gonna move to the next section, which is the neural networks, the idea that everything happens all over the brain. Uh, and, and so we need to think about that. So uh, everybody you know, has their experiences that are based on you know, having a, it, uh, having things happen all over your brain. Where do the neural networks come from? Um, your genetics wires you up in a certain kind of way. It says, here's your potential, your, your brain, your neurons will tend to go this direction and will tend to make these connections. You know, some people will be really good musicians, so music's gonna be, tend to be a part of their uh, connections that they may have in their networks. Um, but what also happens is, when neurons fire over and over and over together again, they build stronger and stronger connections. All right. repeated, repeated firing together makes the, the connection stronger. 
And that becomes a clue to when we're looking at what happens to the folks we work with, what, what makes things work well or what makes things not. You develop, more, you develop more connections between neurons. The axons reach out and touch each other. There are synapses, different little knobs that connect to the neurons together. And those get stronger and stronger when there's repetition over and over of, of events happening. 